We were a little lopsided this morning. <laughs> I'm going to I'm gonna have to l- preach this way. So nice to see everybody here this morning, and especially as we celebrate today. Uh, today is really a special day. Uh, it really is a special time uh, for our church, a uh, special time for uh, those who are being baptized this morning, and of course for their family, for their friends who have come uh, to share in this, uh, this moment, this occasion, very important time. And uh, we praise the Lord for those who are getting baptized. Maria, uh, Drew is being baptized this morning, April, and her son Gavin are all being baptized today, and we praise the Lord for that and uh, for you, for their lives. As we get started, there are a couple of prayer requests. Gary Easy is having his knee replacement surgery this coming Friday, I believe. Is that right? Thursday. Thursday. So Gary's having that complete knee done on Thursday. We want to pray uh, for him. We want to give our condolences, especially to uh, Carolyn Davis's family, Scott and Rachel. Scott's mom went home to be with the Lord a little over a week ago. The memorial service will be here uh, Tuesday. Uh, visitation will be at Bachman Hebbels on Monday, 6 to 8, I think. And then out here for the uh, memorial service uh, at 11 o'clock. So we'll have the memorial service, and then we'll go on out here to the cemetery, come back for luncheon uh, following the, the service. Uh, you know, the great thing about uh, knowing the Lord is we know that Carolyn is not lost. We know where she is. And we know that there'll be a heavenly reunion uh, one of these days, and we praise the Lord uh, for, for that, for sure. Following our service this morning and following our polar plunge, uh, we're... <laughs> It's an inside joke, but you'll figure it out when we get into the tank. And uh, following following our morning service, we have a luncheon provided for everybody. So everybody stick around, plenty of food, and uh, just enjoy the fellowship and the dinner afterwards. Sign up, please, for the uh, University Outreach uh, Mission uh, going on February 21st at uh, Michigan, well, it's Michigan State University. We have our missionary, Travis Wessenberg. Uh, Bill and Nancy's grandson is there working as a missionary, one of our missionaries, and a tremendous work on campus, Michigan State. They have uh, works all over the country and universities all over the United States. Uh, young people coming to know the Lord, kids getting saved in the university. What a, what a great thing. So that uh, breakfast fundraiser will be the 21st. You have to sign up today. I have to have everybody registered this week. So uh, it starts at 8 o'clock. It's at the Eagle Eye Conference Center in Lansing. It's just a great time. I went last year to hear those young kids, uh, those university students, stand up and share how they came to know the Lord, how they got saved. And uh, what a powerful witness that is for them and for us. Uh, to witness that and to be a part of that. So if you haven't signed up, there's a clipboard back there on the table by the offering uh, box there. Uh, Sign up if you'd like to ride with us. We're going to leave at 6.30 to get there by 7.30. But the breakfast actually starts at 8. They have a meet and greet from 7.30 to 8. So if you don't want to get up that early, you can sleep in an extra 15 minutes and drive yourself. So, (laughs) Or you can get up a little earlier and ride with me. So just pray about that. I'd love to have more people come and uh, support our missionaries over there at Michigan State University. So as we begin this morning, let's, let's just bow in prayer. Father, we thank you that you are a gracious God. Thank you, Father, that you have provided salvation for us through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for the forgiveness of our sin. Thank you for your abiding presence with us. Thank you, Lord, for this morning and for the fellowship that we can share together here today. Thank you for your presence with us as we Uh, have this baptism service, Lord. Thank you for Maria and for April, for Gavin, and for their desire, Lord, to step out in obedience and uh, follow you in this baptism. Thank you for each and every one here today. We ask for your blessing over their lives, over our lives, Lord. Use us for your kingdom, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, very special day indeed as we uh, have this baptism service, as we celebrate uh, baptism. Uh, baptism, one of the two ordinances, you know, that's been given to the church, Christ gave to the church, communion and baptism. Both of these uh, are those ordinances that the Christ has given to the local assembly, the local body of believers. We gather together when we have communion, and then as folks uh, get saved and taught, discipled, the desire for baptism and the baptism. Uh, so baptism, we want to talk just briefly a little bit about baptism uh, this morning, uh, before we get too too far, the the believer's baptism, water 
baptism. Uh, first of all, it's an act of obedience. You know, I met a guy some years ago. We were in Alaska on a missions trip, and we met a, a Christian man, and we were having some great conversation. And as I was sharing our testimony and talking about different things, I said something about being obedient to the Lord, and the guy went off the edge. His, his eyes got that big, and he said, what are you talking about? I said, well, you know, being obedient. Oh, we're under grace, man. Er, obedience was almost like a cuss word to this guy. It's like, wait a minute. The Christian life is all about obedience. You know, we, we live in the age of grace. Hallelujah. And if it wasn't for God's grace, we wouldn't be saved. If it wasn't for the grace of God, we wouldn't be able to fellowship together. Salvation is by grace alone in the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith in His death, burial, and resurrection that He died for us. He paid the debt, our debt, right? But we still need to be obedient. Obedience is really the makeup of Christianity. Believers' baptism is an act of obedience. In fact, if you look at Matthew 28, if you want to turn over to Matthew 28 with me, uh, one of the part of the last instructions, listen, the last, one of the last things that Jesus instructs His disciples in is an act of obedience. He says, all power, in verse 18 He starts, all power is given unto Me in heaven and in earth, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you all way, even until the ends of the earth. So what does he say? Make disciples, baptize the believers, and then teach them my commandments. So baptism is in obedience to what the Lord told us to do. To go, out, to go out and make disciples and to baptize them and then to teach them. Listen, baptism is that act of obedience that represents that following, that desire of the believer to be obedient to what Jesus Christ has said. And, you know, obedience really is characteristic of the true believer. If you're a follower of Christ you're going to be living a life of obedience. Now, it doesn't mean you're always obedient, right? I mean, we're all like children and we all kind of, you know, do our own thing, go our own way occasionally. But for the true follower of Jesus Christ, obedience is really part of our makeup. Because if you're saved, you're in Christ and Christ is in you. And that's the picture of baptism we're going to look at here. But it was Jesus himself who said, I only do that which the Father tells me to do. Jesus was obedient. Philippians uh, chapter 2 and verse 8. Even though uh, He was God, He thought it not robbery, robbery to be equal with God. You see the verse, He became a man, He humbled Himself, and He became obedient. He became obedient unto death. Jesus Christ was obedient. He was obedient to His Father. He was obedient to God's will. Not my will, but thy will be done. You know, we've been going through Matthew chapter 13, right? The mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, those parables, those eight parables that Jesus taught there along the Sea of Galilee that time. We went through those. And what was it that we, what, what do we take away from those parables? What is the overall picture of the uh, era of Christendom? That there's a lot of false Christianity in the world today. A lot of false teaching, a lot of false prophets, a lot of false believers. Paul called them false brothers uh, in Christ. And uh, we see through those parables that in the days that we live, there's a lot of false teaching, a lot of false Christians, professors, but not really possessors of eternal life. Obedience is that which characterizes a true child of God. Whereas disobedience when you think about what is the difference between a true follower of Christ, somebody who's really saved and somebody who's not saved, just talking the talk, what's, what's the main thing that differentiates between the two, between the true and the false? Well, number one is that the true believer has a desire to do what Jesus asks him to do. The Word of God tells us that the world is full of false Christians and he defines those as being self-willed, uh, disobedient, Lovers of self rather than lovers of God. Uh, 
self-willed, strong-minded, um, unteachable. You know, those are things that would characterize those who really just claim to be religious or a part of a church group or whatever, but obedience. Listen, obedience is really the key here. For the believer who follows Christ in baptism is acting out of obedience. He is being obedience. A true believer obeys Christ's commands, uh, all of them, or at least we try to, right? I mean, we might struggle in one area or another area, but really overall, we desire to do all that Jesus taught us. That's what he said in Matthew 28, teaching them to observe just a couple of things that I taught you guys. Is that what he said? Don't worry about the moral stuff. Just worry about the doctrinal stuff. Is that what Jesus said? No, no. It's the morality. It's the life of the individual Christian who is going to be obedient to all things that he has taught us as his children. Why? Because we're to be representatives of Jesus Christ. If he's living in me, then it's the life of Christ then truly that we want to see in our life to observe everything that I have commanded you. So baptism is number one, it's an act of obedience, but it's an act of obedience that's motivated by love, by love. Why? Because Jesus said, if you love me, you'll do what? You'll obey me. If you love me, you'll keep my word. Who it is that loveth me, but he that keepeth my commandments. And his commandments are so hard. The commandments of Jesus Christ are so burdensome. Oh, it's so hard. Is it really? Love your neighbor as yourself. You know, follow me. Put on Christ. You know, we can make it difficult as a Christian. If we get all tangled up in, you know, all the laws and this and that. And the other thing, Jesus said, the true follower of Jesus Christ is going to be obedient to me. Led of the Spirit of God. The child of God is led by the Spirit of God. God. Baptism, the believer's baptism, this water baptism that we're talking about here is a profession of our faith. It's a blessing not only to those who are being baptized, but it's also a witness to the family and to the friends who, have, who are here today to, to see this act of baptism. It's an outward expression. Listen, baptism is an outward expression of their faith and of their devotion and of their desire to walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's an act of faith. It's a profession of their faith. Romans chapter 6, 1 through 4. I was going to go through this verse by verse, word by word, every Greek meaning, but we don't have time. You don't have to do that tonight. But listen, in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, it lays out the spiritual significance of our baptism. What does it represent? What, what is the water baptism a picture of? What, what is it a symbol of? It's a witness of the saving work of Jesus Christ. It represents, this baptism represents Christ's death, his burial, and his resurrection. So when a believer walks into the water and begins to freeze to death, the heat, we had a little problem with the tank, but uh, we'll get the job done. But as the believer enters into the tank, enters into the water, goes under the water and rises up out of the water, what we see is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ and his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Romans 6 tells us then, we that are risen in Christ should walk in the newness of what? Life. We have a new life in Christ. When a believer comes up out of the water, then he himself is representing or symbolic of that saying in his testimony, guess what? I've died with Jesus. I've been buried with Jesus, and just as Jesus died and was buried and rose again, so I too now am risen again, spiritually born again. That's what took place inside. The water baptism is that outward expression, the visible picture of that which took place when you got saved. I'm rising up out of the water to live a new life. It is my commitment publicly telling all of you guys in baptism that, you know what, I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to follow him if need be, all the way to the cross. Being obedient even unto death. The believer's baptism, that act of going down into the water and coming up again is a symbol. It's symbolic. It doesn't save you. The water baptism, you know, you can jump in that tank with a bar of soap and you still ain't going to scrub your sins away. It just ain't going to happen. 
Years ago, we were baptizing in Gull Lake. And uh, we were informed that the DNR was contemplating on uh, requiring a permit for churches to baptize in a public lake. I guess they didn't want all those sins polluting the waterway. <laughs> I don't know really what their idea behind that one was, but it didn't go anywhere, at least why we were never arrested for it. We might as well be doing it in the lake today. I'm just trying to scare you guys, that's all. <laughs> don't worry, Maria. You won't feel a thing. <laughs> Once you jump in there... <laughs> Instant numbness. <laughs> but baptism, the water baptism, doesn't save us. The water baptism is a picture of that which took place spiritually, internally. We were nailed to that cross with the Lord Jesus Christ. We were buried with Him and we were risen again to a new life. Christ died and rose again. That's the gospel. And that's our hope this morning. So what is the requirement for baptism. Who can get baptized? Who should be baptized? Everyone should be baptized. Everybody needs to be baptized. But everybody obviously needs to get saved. I mean, we need to be saved. You have to be saved to be baptized. What is the requirement? Acts chapter 8, very clear. If you have your Bibles, you want to turn over to Acts chapter 8 real quick. We're going to tell a, an account of a man from Ethiopia. Now, Philip was evangelizing. He was out preaching and teaching and a great revival was going on. And, and uh, so then the Lord spoke to him and told him he wanted to get, leave where you're at and head down that road towards uh, Ethiopia. And as he went, it says that he saw this guy, this Ethiopian man, this Ethiopian eunuch, uh, chapter 8, 26, starting in verse 26, down through 39. So he sees this guy, very important individual, high in the courts of Queen Candace of Ethiopia. And he sees this guy, and the guy is reading the Bible. He'd been to Jerusalem to worship, probably Passover. He'd been up there. He was probably a proselyte. You know, had converted to Judaism. And here he is reading from Isaiah. And the Lord says, hey, climb up in that guy's car and, uh, you know, introduce yourself. You know, it's amazing how God works. You could be standing in a parking lot, and if you're listening, the Lord might say, hey, go over there and knock on that guy's window. Now, you might get shot, but hey. <laughs> Nowadays, you just don't know. But to be obedient to the Lord, Philip was obedient to the leading of the Spirit of God. He drew up alongside that chariot, heard the guy reading Isaiah, chapter 53, by the way, and he asks him, hey, do you understand what you're reading? And the man said, no, I don't understand it. How can I understand it unless somebody explains it to me? The importance of your personal testimony and witness to your family and to your friends and to your neighbors. It's one thing to see you as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus Christ. It's another thing to hear the gospel. Because you got to hear it. That's what Romans says. You got to hear it. You got to hear it to believe it. And if you're not hearing it, how are they ever going to believe? As Romans tells us. So he jumps up in the chariot with this guy. He's in the chariot with him. And he's explaining to him Isaiah chapter 53. And what happened to this Ethiopian man? The guy got saved. Isaiah 53, the prophecies of the suffering Christ. He was led to the slaughter as a sheep. Uh, his, he didn't open his mouth. By his wounds, by his, uh, tr his wounds, his stripes were healed. It was for our transgressions that he was bruised. It was for our iniquity that he was chastened. He went to that cross because of your sin. Jesus died on that cross because of your disobedience, my disobedience, my sinfulness. Listen, when Christ went to that cross, he didn't go there because you were so worthy of dying for. Did you know that? Sometimes mankind, sometimes Christians become so audacious in their in their, in their thinking that Jesus died on that cross because I'm so special. I'm such a good guy. I'm so worthy. No. Romans 5 tells us very clearly, while we were yet sinners, 
while we were ungodly, while we were the very enemies of God, Christ came and died for us. He didn't die for you because you're so worthy. He didn't die for you because you're so good looking. Well, my wife, on the other hand. No, not even my beautiful wife. No. Jesus came and died because of sin. That cross represents the total depravity of mankind. We are not worthy. We never were worthy. We never will be worthy of his death. He died because he unconditionally loves you. He created you. He knows you. He loves you. He desires you. That's God's love. That's that unconditional love. That's that amazing love of God that reached down into the sinful, hateful, mean world and poured out his precious blood for you and for me placing his very life within us, delivering us from this present evil world of darkness and sin and corruption and wickedness. Oh, he became a man so that he might die our death. And that's what he was reading in Isaiah 53. And P Philip explained it to him. And the man got saved. Verse 37 or verse 36, this Ethiopian eunuch they're riding along in their Corvette, and all of a sudden, a guy sees a, a creek or a stream or a pond or a pool. He sees water, and he says, stop the car. Wait a minute. Put on the brakes. And he says to Philip, hey, what doth hinder me from being baptized? Right out of the gate, man. This guy wants to be baptized. Philip obviously explained to him the counsel of God, the whole counsel of God, gave him the gospel. The man got saved. The man saw water, and he said, hey, wait a minute. Can I get baptized? That's what Jesus tells us to do. That's what I want to do. And Philip said, under one condition, under one condition, if thou believest, notice verse 37, if thou believest with all thine heart, you can. I'm going to ask our Baptist, our Baptists, <laughs> we're going to ask our Baptist candidates this morning, Publicly, do you believe that Jesus Christ died for you, for your sin, was buried and rose again? I've asked them already, so we know their answer. But that's the question. And the man said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe Jesus. And it was Jesus who said, He who liveth and believeth in me shall what? Never die. Have everlasting life. Receive the forgiveness of their sin. Receive the fullness of His Spirit. Have His name written down in glory. Hallelujah. Have a home prepared for us in heaven. Saved. Never to fear the wrath or the punishment, the just punishment of God. To be saved. Oh, I'm glad I'm saved. And I hope you all saved too. Because the idea of not being saved and leaving this earth is not a very pleasant thought at all. In fact, God said that he has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Hell was prepared for Satan and his angels, not for God's creation. Every man is given that opportunity. Every man has that choice. Am I going to believe Jesus or not? And if you've believed Jesus Christ, then you need to be obedient and you need to follow him in that step of obedience, baptism. He got saved, he got baptized. And in fact, if you read through the book of Acts and you see all the different ones, their testimonies, the ones who were saved that they bring out in Scripture, there's a lot, thousands. But the ones that are revealed to us in the book of Acts, there was Cornelius, and then there was Lydia, there was the Philippian jailer, there was the Corinthians, there was all of these individuals. And you notice the sequence of events? Somebody went, they heard, they believed, and then they were what? Oh, they waited a few years, you know, had to think about it. No, they were immediately baptized. Listen, if you're born again this morning, if you're saved and you've never been baptized, you need to get on the stick, man, or get in the tank. <laughs> if you're not baptized, we'll baptize you this morning. If you're saved, if you're born again, you need to get the job done. And that's what this Philippian, this is what this Ethiopian guy told Philip. There's water, I believe. Let's get her done. <laughs> Let's get her done. And they did. They stopped. And he baptized this man 
there alongside of the road. And then notice what the result was. The Lord snatched up Philip. His work wasn't finished. And it says, And the Ethiopian went on his way rejoicing. This is truly a, an occasion to rejoice about. A believer standing up and saying, I want to follow Jesus Christ. Not because I have to, but because I want to. Not because it's a requirement, but because I love Jesus. And I want the world to know that I'm going to follow Him. And it's our responsibility as the local congregation. It's our job, our responsibility as brothers and sisters in Christ. When, when somebody's saved and then they're baptized, it's our responsibility to bring them in, to love them, to teach them, to encourage them, to help them all along the way. That's what the body of believers is about. That's what the local church is all about. Our responsibility, we rejoice together in you people who are getting baptized today. We rejoice, that's right. Smile on the inside is rejoicing. But then we make that commitment that we'll help you. We're here for you. We'll do what we can for you. So I'm going to ask the folks to go change. Gail's on this side and Gavin on this side. Uh, just go right behind that little curtain there. And uh, there's a door there. There's a door on that side behind that curtain. So Maria, April, uh, you two like to go over there. Gavin, you want to go right behind the piano there, right back up there. You'll, you'll see the, the little room up there where you can change. And to get ready, Andy Giroux, Marie's father, is going to be in the tank with us today. What an honor for a dad to be able to participate, to be able to baptize his daughter. What a great thing. What a wonderful thing. So Andy, I'm looking forward to freezing with you this morning. If you guys want to jump in and start warming it up, that'd be fine with me. <clears throat> that baptism tank is a real saint perfecter. We've been in there when it's so hot you turned red quick. Come out looking like a lobster. And we've been in there when it's frozen. Somewhere there's got to be a happy medium with this thing. But nonetheless... God is faithful. Amen. We're going to have the worship team come as we close in prayer. This worship team, come on up. And again, following the service, then uh, we'll be changing and you guys can all just kind of hang out and they'll have the meal prepared here shortly and just stick around and enjoy the fellowship. Our Father, this morning we're so thankful that you've made it possible for the littlest of little and the oldest of old to be saved, to hear the good news the gospel, the simplicity of the gospel, that God, you loved us so much that you gave your only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life, that Jesus died for our sin, that he was buried and rose again on the third day according to the scriptures, and that whosoever, whoever believes in him has passed from death into life. Father, this morning, you know each and every heart here. We know that eternity looms on the horizon, that death will come for us all, some today, some tomorrow. Lord, I pray that as you search hearts here this morning, that you would speak to those who are not saved, that your love would convict them of their need for you, of that coming day of judgment when the dead will be raised up and stand before that great white throne. And the names will be searched out. Father, that you would draw them to yourself this morning. If you're here today and you're not saved, I'd ask you to seriously consider confessing to the Lord Jesus Christ today your need of Him. That you would agree with Him that yes, you are a sinner. And that yes, He died for you even while you were at odds with Him and a sinner. And that you would confess with your mouth this morning that Jesus died and was buried and rose again for you and that through faith alone in Jesus, you can be saved. Would you be willing to do that today? If you're here and you're not saved, you don't know that you'd go to heaven if you'd die right now. You don't know that, if, that you would be freed from the wrath and the judgment of God. If you don't know those things, you can by simply asking Him by faith today, believing that Jesus can do for you what you cannot do for yourself. And that's save yourself. You can't do it. Would you ask him? Would you just simply cry out, Lord, save me. I'm a sinner and I need you. Would you do that?
Are you a follower of Jesus here this morning? Are you a Christian? Are you a true Christian? Have you followed the Lord in obedience and baptism, that first step? And if you haven't, why not? And would you give your life to the Lord today? Would you make that decision? Yes, I will be baptized. Yes, I will follow the Lord in obedience. Would you do that? Father, thank you for your presence with us today. Thank you for your faithfulness to us, for your great love, and for allowing us to gather this morning and worship you. We give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with us, would you? Gavin, you believe that the Lord Jesus Christ died for you, that he was, born, that he was buried and rose again on the third day, yes. and that you believe that he did that for you, and you've accepted him as your Savior. So Gavin, we're going to turn you around face, face that way, okay. and uh, Andy, you want to get on this side over here? So if you want to take this, plug your nose, you want to take your glasses off? Yeah. Uh, so you just do this. Take that. It won't even hurt. And we're gonna keep your arms tight. We're gonna hold right onto your arms like this. And we're gonna we're gonna tip you back. Try to get you under the water there. So, Gavin, upon the confession of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Yeah, that's all. Good job, Gavin. Good job, man. Glasses. Glasses. Oh, I'll get those in my. Okay, I'll send right there. April. Would you like to come in and? Yeah, it's a little chilly. <laughs> Anything you'd like to say? Yeah. Okay. April, in the presence of our Heavenly Father, our friends, your family, do you believe that the Lord Jesus Christ died for you, that he was buried and rose again on the third day? Yes. You've accepted him as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Yes, you have. So, April, upon the confession of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hold your wrist like that, and we'll take you by the elbows. Mm -hmm. She's a brave soul. It's warmer than Lake Superior. <laughs> Maria, do you believe that the Lord Jesus Christ died for you on the cross, was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures? Yes, absolutely. And you have asked him to save you? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, anything you want to say? Not necessarily. God is great. <laughs> God is great. Amen. How do you add to that? Andy, you want to say anything? Maria, I'm proud of you. And I'm proud of your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior. And I see the Holy Spirit filling you into doing this. And I'm just pumped about it. Spoken from a true dad. <laughs> Amen. Okay, Maria. If you'd like to take hold your elbows with one hand, put your hand, grab your wrist with the other hand. We're going to hold you by the elbows. And we're going to tilt you back. Maria? And upon your faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Stand as we close this morning. Let's stand.
Just turn and give your neighbor a big hug and tell him praise the Lord. We are dismissed. <laughs>